do study forms, which is one of the main ways that we get information from the user to the script, so the script can do its thing. And what I'm talking about are things like logins. You know, you go to Angel, you type in a form, your user ID and password, you click the submit button, that goes to the server, and the server does something with that. It makes sure, first of all, that you're a valid user and that your password is correct. It then goes and looks up in a database what classes you're enrolled in, and it shows those classes, and so on and so forth. So every person that logs on to Angel gets a screen that looks a little bit differently. That's because it's not a plain old HTML page that is static, never changing. It is a script. It's a little program that runs and takes your information and customizes the page for you. And, I mean, most of the major sites on the web are done with server-side scripting. You know, Facebook, eBay, Google, goes on and on. Because if you think about it, um, you know, your Facebook page looks different than mine. Um, eBay is constantly being updated with new products and new bids. Uh, Google, you type in a search term, you get distinct to you. All right. So we started off last week with probably the simplest kind of form imaginable. And that was a form that did a search by calling the Bing search engine. And we'll take a look and review that form, and then we'll go forward. Again, since this class does not cover server-side scripting, we had to borrow someone else's script. And many services like Bing, you know, allow encourage you to do that because you can create a custom search on your page, for example. And that's what we did here. We took the, we took a, and created a form. What we've entered into a text box and does a search result for you. So it knew based on the fact I gave to the Bing search engine, I wrote this page, and I gave to the Bing search script the search term that I typed in the form, Cleveland Indians, and I click Submit, and it shows me the search for them. I was amazed by the way the baseball season had started. I, I, I'm serious. I mean, I swear, I mean, I knew they were in spring training, right, because I, I saw news reports and all that, but I wasn't paying attention. And I just saw a thing like about opening day, and, it's like, and then it's like, well, it is April, so, you know, there you go. All right, and uh, Tune in next week where we check to see if the Indians have been eliminated uh, mathematically from the playoffs. Just kidding. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I'm not. But not. Yeah. All right. So let's look at the script and let's review a couple key elements. I said script. Let's look at the page. That's what I meant to say. All right, pretty basic, as basic as we could humanly possibly make this. It simply has one text box on it and a submit button. It's wrapped in a form tag. Now remember, you have one form tag per, not form control, but for requests that you're making to a server. So for example, if you were creating an account where you had to enter in your username, your password, your first name, your last name, your address, city, state, zip, phone number, email address, that would be one request to, hey, make an account for me with this information. So there would be one form tag for that. Much of the time, when you see a page, there will be only one form on that page regardless of how many form fields are on that page. 
One of the cases where there are multiple forms on a page is where you have, here's the form to create an account, next to it is the form to log on. Because those are two different requests. One is to create an account, the other is to log on. Right? Those are two different things you're asking the server to do. All right? In this case, we simply have one form because our request is simply to do a search for this information. Associated with the form are two attributes. There's a method and there is an action. Typically you will have always both of these. If you don't put them in, there's some defaults, but we won't consider that case today. The method refers to the manner in which the data gets passed from the client to the server. We are using a method of get. That means that the data is passed to the server via the query string. What do I mean by the query string? I mean this. I do a search for Notice that on the URL, part of the URL is what I entered into that form. It's after the question mark. Question mark, question, query, all right? So Everything after the question mark is a query string, and it's typically going, to, typically going to be data that we've passed from our form to the server. Now, in this case, what we're passing to the server is two things. One is that uh, is the term that we're searching for. So notice it says Q equals New York Yankees. All right. Notice it put pluses there instead of spaces. It does that just so that uh, spaces in a URL can confuse a web server, so you put pluses in there instead. Notice that Q matches the name of my text box. If I look here at my text box, the name I have given it is Q. So that's why on the query string, we see Q equals. And this represents what I've typed into the text box. So Q equals, boom, this. All right. Now, I did some Bing searches to, to understand what I needed to call these things because what you call a field on the client side needs to match what it's expecting on the server side. All right. So I think I did an example last time where I, I changed the name to something other than Q. Well, the server's not expecting it to be called something other than Q. Therefore, the server doesn't know how to handle that. So I just went and did some regular searches and I saw on the query string, I reverse engineered it, where it said Q equals and knew that that was the value of that. The query string elements always look like this. No matter what kind of form control you're talking about, we're going to talk about a little bit later on some other form controls. And regardless the form, form control is always the name of the form control equals and then the value of that. If you notice here, we actually have a submit button equals submit. Well, the name of the submit button was go and the value is defined as submit. So that's why we also see that on the query string. The action is the name of the script that's being called. And again, I did a Bing search and reverse engineer, saw what they called the script, and so on. Keep in mind, most of the time, you're, you or 
people in your team is, are writing both sides of it. You're writing the client side and the server side. So in many cases, you're going to be writing both. So you'll know what you've called the script, or you should know what you've called the script. And you'll know what you need to call these things on in the form to, so the server side script can pull them up and use them. So that is the action and method of a form. We have two different tags here. Input type equals text, and we have a name and an ID. A name is different than the ID. All right, a name is a different thing than the ID. You could make them the same value if you wanted to. In fact, I oftentimes do, just then I don't have to worry about it. All right, but they're used for different things. The name is a name that's going to get passed to the server. The ID is used sort of internally within my page. And we'll see an example of that in a, in a minute here. So this will give me a text box. A text box is literally that, a box in which you can put text. All right? What kind of text? Any kind. Is there a way to limit it to only be numbers or only be a date? Yes. How, how do you do that? All right. Well, there's two ways to do it. There's an old school way and there's an HTML5 way. The HTML5 way is that there are a whole bunch of new form controls in HTML5 where you can say it's going to be a date and then you can't enter something other than a date. But as we know, HTML5 is not supported for everyone. All right? So the old school way is you would write JavaScript to go and look and make sure that it, it's a number or a date or whatever. All right? We're not going to worry about that right away. Um, towards the end of this section, probably on Thursday, we're going to look at some of the new HTML5 form controls. All right? But you have to, you have to treat those with a grain of salt. All right? Um, because not all browsers support them. Now, here's the nice, well, we'll, we'll, we'll save that to when we, get, when we get to that section. I don't want to confuse the issue. So type of text is a text box where I can put a single line of text. A submit button is a button that says, send this form to the server. Submit this request to the server. And the request will be to this URL, and it will pass whatever form tags I have in here, whatever inputs and other form controls I have in here. In this case, because I use the get, will pass via the query string. Same thing if you have a post. The only difference is you don't see it. It gets passed a different way. So there's actually a couple different kinds of buttons. The submit one is the one that says, go and do it. Go to this script, pass this data, and do your thing with it. Process it. Questions about any of this so far? Notice that we have a label here. All right? A label is used to tie a text description of the field with the form control. Now, why do you need to do that? Well, in this case, it's, it's pretty obvious because I only have one element on the, on the form. But if you could imagine if I had a whole bunch of fields, name, address, phone number, and so on. Let me draw. Let me draw uh, what that would kind of look like. I feel like I didn't get trained on operation of this. That it looks good. Let's say I had a name and a text box, a email and a text box, a city and a text box, a state and a text box. All right. I hope you can see that. Yeah. What do I put in here? But what, what field do I put in there? What piece of data do I put in there? 
It's not a trick question. The state. <laughs> All right. How do you know that? Because the label says so. Well, and and more specifically, you have vision, and you are able to see that this is right next to this. So you know that this belongs to this. All right? So you know because you can see the label belongs to that tag. All right? Because you simply know that it's next to it, it belongs to it. Now close your eyes. Yeah, close your eyes. What do I put in here? Something. <laughs> Something. You have no idea. So people that can't see and access the computer via a screen reader can't look and see what's the text next to this text box. So they have a screen reader that will read them the label associated with that. Well, how do you define the label associated with that? You define that via a label tag. So, label four. QID. What is QID? That is the, the ID of the label. Or, I'm sorry, the, la the ID of the text box that the label belongs to. So this is what connects this text with this label. Remember, how is a user going to be navigating if they can't see? They're going to be using the tab key to tab around the fields. So you could type in the name and then go click on the email field and you can see the email label right next to it. They'll be in the name field and tab from the name into the next text field. Well, they can't see the label associated with it, but the screen reader will read for them that this is the email address or the city or the state or the zip. All right? But what do you have to do to make that work? You need to have the label tag in there and you need to tie it together. The ID that you put here has to match the ID that you put here. All right? You don't really need to do that with the button because the button already has a value of submit that the screen reader can read. So, this is a case of universal design, right? We're showing the fact that those things belong together two different ways. One way is we're showing it by the fact that it is physically next to the text box. The other way that we're showing it is the fact that the label tag ties it together. Now, the label tag doesn't really help someone that can see, right? They don't need it, but it doesn't get in their way. It's a few extra bytes that get downloaded. No big deal there, all right? It's almost like outside of our classroom, I believe, I'm pretty sure anyhow, Outside the classroom is the, cl is the, the room number in Braille. All right? Um, you may or may not have noticed that. All right? But it didn't get in your way. So by putting the label tag in, it's not like it's going to damage or make a lesser experience for people that can see, but it will benefit people that can't see. Now, labels have another purpose that we'll get to possibly today and possibly um, on Thursday. And that is we can use the label to style stuff. All right? You can use the label to style stuff. And that's a good thing. All right? As Martha Stewart would say. All right? Yeah. Well, doesn't she always say that? It's a good thing. Yeah. All right. So remember that. Put that in the back of your head, that we're going to use these, even though we're not doing it for that reason, we can take advantage of it and do some styling with the label to, to make our forms look nice. All right? Okay. So we've talked about accessibility with forms. We've talked about the basic client-server interaction. We've talked about text boxes. What more do we have to talk about forms? We have three things to talk about, and we'll do these between today and Thursday. One thing is more form controls. The text box and the submit button aren't the only form controls that, that we have. We have other form controls as well. 
Second thing is styling forms. How can we make, how can we make our forms look good and still be accessible? And number three is the new HTML5 form controls. So you got to take those with a little bit, uh, with a grain of salt, because keep in mind that not all browsers support HTML5 form controls. But as time goes on and more browsers do, these form controls are pretty slick, and so you can incorporate those on your, in your app. The nice thing is, is that, again, they revert to text boxes if, the browser doesn't support them. This is a case of what's called graceful degradation, right? We can take advantage of a new feature. If the new feature doesn't work on a browser because the browser doesn't support that, we have sort of a plan B that will make sure that it kind of works, that it doesn't, it doesn't break the page, that the page still works. Maybe not as cool or as slickly as um, it would otherwise, but at least, at least it still works. At least the person can get the job done. All right, other form controls. You probably have all seen forms on the web and other form controls. What are there besides text boxes? All right, let's... I feel so dumb right now. But it's not right. Oh. Uh, you see, I aptitude test, it probably had that I, I lacked, uh, what would that be called, spatial, uh, spatial reasoning or whatever, yeah. That's why I got in, the, that's really why I got in, into programming, is like, I'm not, I'm not good with things. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'm, I'm good with, like, ideas and, and thoughts. And, and so, uh, yeah, so. A simple problem like that, I'm sitting scratching my head for, for days. All right. Okay, check boxes. So, so let's, let's keep a list. We have a text box. We have a submit box. Those are the two that we had from last time. We have a checkbox. Okay. Before we go, radio button. We'll put that on here. What checkbox used for? Yeah. A checkbox represents a yes or no. All right. Um, the the typical one that you see is, do you agree with the terms and conditions? You check it to indicate yes. All right. Do you want to join our email list? Checkbox. You know, are you over? You know, are you over twenty one? Check the box and so on. All right. So this represents a yes or no question. What does a radio button represent? Okay, that's good. A singular choice or mutually exclusive choice. The difference is, what's the difference between a checkbox and a radio button? No, you can't. Okay, let, 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 all right, let's back up before we, we get fisticuffs in here. And I have to go. I was actually talking to a friend of mine who is a, a nurse in a psych ward, and she mentioned that she uh, had, uh, security had to come for an unruly patient or something. And I told her, through my time at LC, 
I've never had to call security. So thank goodness. I hope I maintain that record. Some of the, some of the instructor stations actually have a panic button that you could click on, like, like, like if that escalated between you two students, I could just go and click the button and, and someone from security would come just, yeah, exactly. All right, at any rate, the difference between a checkbox and a radio button is this. A checkbox, you only have two options, on or off, yes or no. A radio button, you can have as many as you need. All right? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, no, maybe. Depends on the day. Most of the time not. Whatever. So you can have a range. You can have more than two options with the radio button. But a radio button, a single radio button group can only have one value check. Here's where the confusion or the possible confusion uh, lies in. I could have more than one radio button group. All right. So I could have, um, like, for example, um, um, major, CISS, accounting, everything else. All right. Then I could have a second one that said um, year of school, first, second, third, and fourth. Each of these are radio button groups which means for each of these I can pick one option. And again, they're like the radio buttons in your car. If, you listen, if you're listening to one station and you press a button, it goes off the other station and onto the new station. It doesn't like, you can't listen to two stations at the same time. That'd actually be cool. That would be like the John Cage radio buttons for those of you who like avant-garde uh, music. But you can only pick one. Radio button groups, but then I could pick one from here and one from here. So, in now, now with checkboxes, each checkbox, there are no such thing as groups of checkboxes. All right. So if I have multiple checkboxes, they work independently by definition. So if I have agree to terms, sign up for mailing list, whatever. I can check any combination of those that I want uh, because, again, they're, they're not tied together anyway. So, checkbox represents two options. Radio button represents multiple options. All right. And, but you have more than one group of those. And, but within a group, only one option can be selected. Could I do yes or no? I can do yes or no with the checkbox, right? We, we stated that at the beginning. Could I do yes or no with a radio button? Yeah, sure. I could have, you know, agree to terms or conditions. Yes, no. Or agree to term conditions and have a checkbox. What's the difference between these two? Yeah, it really, conceptually, there isn't a difference. The difference is um, the appearance on the screen. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think if there's something small, some small implication, there really isn't. All right? But with this, you could pick Agree. So why would you decide to do one versus the other? Well, not really. Both of these can represent a yes or no. Okay. 
conceptually, in other words, if you're doing a survey, do you agree or disagree? Yes, no, yes, no. That might be clearer to the user than having a single checkbox that you check if you agree, leave it unchecked if you disagree. Because for one thing, look at it this way. If I have a checkbox that says, do you agree with this? What if I forget to check it? What does that mean? It means you disagree, but I don't disagree, I just forgot to check it. If I have a radio button, I explicitly have to check agree or disagree. And then I could have JavaScript to validate that I've picked at least one. All right? So yeah, for something like that, or like a true or false question on a test, it would be good. So conceptually, one might seem better for the situation. Another thing that it might be better is, is just how visually the form looks. Does it look better? So let's say, for example, I have a bunch of radio buttons. Um, I might then want to continue that and be consistent and have the next one be yes or no, uh, representing with a radio button instead of a checkbox, just for consistency on the form and so on. Now, here's one thing that you should never do, and I get a couple people to do this every year on the pizza assignment, all right, is that they put a radio button, and again, if you haven't noticed so far, the squares are the checkboxes, the circles are the radio buttons. They'll do something like this, delivery, and they'll put a radio button here, a single radio button. What is wrong with that? Well, Pardon me? you could make it an on or off. You know, functionally, you could get this to work, except, except, here's the real problem. Can't change your mind if you do that, right? Because a radio button group can initially have nothing checked, but once you check something, something is going to stay checked. So unless there's something else to click on, that's always going to stay checked. So in other words, if I'm ordering a pizza um, and I click, uh, yes, I want it delivered, then I stop and think, ooh, I'm out of cash. I have to go stop at the, the, the ATM to pick up some cash to pay for this pizza. Well, I'm going out anyhow. I might as well pick it up. There's no way to uncheck it then. So single radio button, no. So I hope I do not see that this semester. Again, I always, I always forget to mention that. I hope people sort of figure that out on their own. And it's not that it doesn't work. It, it, it kind of works, but you could never change your mind then. All right? So anytime you have a yes or no set, uh, uh, situation, if you're going to do it via uh, a radio button, make sure there's a yes and no radio button. All right. Other form controls. Other form controls, text box, submit button, check box, radio button. <laughs> there's a few others. There's a few that I would, I, w I would not be surprised that you'd miss, but yeah, there's a few I would expect you get. A drop. What is a drop down similar to? Could be a checkbox. Okay, so what does that make it like? Radio button. <laughs> right. With a drop down, well, actually, you could make it work. How could you make a drop down work like a radio button? Uh, well, I'm sorry, work like a checkbox. How can you make it work like a single checkbox? I just have one option, have two options, yes or no, just like the radio buttons. So really, drop downs, radio button groups, and check boxes are similar. And what's similar about them is that they force you to pick from a predefined list of things. All right? And in the case of a checkbox, 
yes or no are your options. In the case of a radio button, you can define as many options as you want. In the case of a checkbox, you can define as many options as you want. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that with drop downs, unlike radio buttons, drop downs, there's always one item selected. This is where it's different than C sharp. In C sharp, you can have a drop down where nothing is selected. Whereas in HTML, you either explicitly say which one's selected. If you don't define that, by default, the top one is selected. That's a little different than radio buttons. With radio buttons, if you don't specify what's selected, none of them are selected. Yes? Exactly. So what you could do to do around that, if you didn't want to have a default, is you could make the top one sort of a, a, a dummy choice to say, please select the item, or all dashes, or space, or whatever. All right. When would you use a drop down, uh, a checkbox for yes or no, so we could use all three of these. We could use for yes or no. All right. And again, for the reasons that we described, you'd pick one or the other. When would you choose between a radio button group and a drop down? If, if, you had, if I had, for example, a list of majors that you could major in, what would, what would, which would be better? Drop down because it visually takes up less real estate. So in the case of majors, I joke I only put up three majors a minute ago, but really on campus there's probably a hundred or so majors, I would guess, maybe more, who knows. But there's a lot of them. And if I could do that and have an individual radio button for each of them, but that would be that would be awkward. Alright? So therefore I'm going to use a drop down. So if I'm going to do states, would be another example. Drop down makes sense for states as opposed to a radio button. Pardon me? So larger quantities. What's the advantage of a radio button? If you have less choices, if let's say you only had four choices, what year of school are you in, first, second, third, or fourth, then you see all the options without having to click the drop down. Like a t-shirt size. Exactly. Now, that being said, you could, for example, do a t-shirt size either way, and there might be reasons that even though you look and say, well, there's only a handful of choices, well, I still want to use a drop-down, because maybe I have other drop-downs on the page, and sort of visual consistency, I, I would do that. So there's a lot of considerations, but I guess what I'm saying is you want to consider, first of all, what your options are, what options make sense, what options don't make sense, and then make a decision. The reason that you use any of these is because you want to limit the value. I could use, you could put t-shirt size in a text box. And what would be the problem with that? Misspelling? Abbreviation? Yeah, you could, you could put in one person could put, type in small, another person could type in X. Another person could write little, all right, or tiny, all right, uh, or XL, or 2XL, or 2XLT. Well, what if they don't carry a 2XLT, you know? Or a stock or something, yeah. So the idea of any of these extra ones is they limit the choices. Because, remember at the other end, there's a server-side script. And that server-side script is expecting things in a certain way. If the t-shirt company only has these sizes, and you're going to put an order in their database, you have to make sure that it matches one of their legit sizes. Okay? Couple other fields. Field types, rather. What is a list box? That actually is a drop down that you just style a certain way. So in other words, where it doesn't drop down but it shows you all five selections, yeah, that's actually a drop down. In addition, little known fact, a drop down you can actually configure so that the user can make multiple choices. All right? So for example, if you had the case of major, 
I was using that example before as though a student only had one major. It's possible a student could have multiple majors, right? Well, you could have a drop down and the user could click, 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 and click that. It has to be configured in a certain way, though. It's one of the attributes. One of the attributes defines that a drop down only has, by default, a drop down only has one option, but you can override that. That being said, I'd be careful because most people don't realize that you can select more than one in a drop down. So I would put some description on the page or something to clue people in. So another form control. Oh, uh, you're close. What's. You're warm. Yeah. A, and the, and the, the proper name for this is a text area. Well, no, you have the idea right. It's something that's used for comments or description where you don't put in a single line of text. The text box represents a single line of text. The text area represents multiple lines of text. So if you had a place for comments or complaints or whatever, then you would put a text area on the page. All right, so that's a different control. There actually is a password control, which actually is a type of text box. But the difference is, is that it doesn't display your password. There's actually two kinds of, two other kinds of buttons. One of them we'll talk about later in the semester, and one about I'm going to mention, and we will never speak of it again. It'll be like Voldemort, all right? It's the Voldemort of buttons. It's the button that shall not be named. The button that we'll come back to later on is a plain old button button, all right? Notice you can always change the meaning of the word by repeating it. Is it, is it hot today? Well, it's hot, but it's not hot, hot. All right. It's a button, but yeah, is it a button button? A button button is a button that is not does not submit to the server, but it invokes some JavaScript. So when we talk about JavaScript at, towards the end of the semester, we'll talk about the button button. So we can use that to kick our, in some JavaScript. For example, if we had a page like I just went through the painful uh, exercise of filing my taxes. And I was filing those online. Well, there was a button to do the math. So I put in all the stuff and I click and do the math. Um, that didn't send it to the server. JavaScript is sophisticated enough where it can go and do some math. It can grab this box and subtract this box and add this box and multiply by 10%, whatever. So that doesn't go to the server. But there's some JavaScript that does some calculation. So that was a button button. So we'll talk about that when we get into JavaScript. The other one is the clear or reset button. Why are we never going to mention that again? We don't want to use them ever. Intelligence as a professor forces me to at least mention it, but don't put them on your form. Why do I say don't put them on your form? Because no one likes to type things again and people are liable to accidentally click on it. And if you're going to change, you know, imagine if I'm going in and I'm registering for an Amazon account. Mike Zeller's address 1005 Abbey Road North. Uh, Elyria, Ohio, 440. Wait a minute. No, I'm not Mike. I'm his brother Jerry that lives in Brooklyn. That's not going to happen, right? Chances are, if I'm going to change something, it's like, oh, I put my home phone there. I really want to put my cell phone. So I don't want to clear out everything. There are some rare occasions where clear buttons are good, but they're very rare. There's an article in the resource section by Jacob Nielsen that talks about uh, reset buttons. And if you want to see an example of a bad reset button, I can't help but do this. LC's website to do a search for classes. Where do you search for classes? 
Exactly. Uh, my campus, is that? Yeah. Okay, schedule of classes. All right, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to decide what to take in the summer. All right, all right, so I'll go click summer. Class search. All right, I want to take a CISS class. All right, I don't care which one it is. Additional search criteria. I'm sure there is. It's thinking about it. Oh, maybe you do. Or not. Or not. Oh, this will work. This will work with this. This will work with this. If there was additional search criteria, there would be even more reason to complain about this. Look what we have here. Look at the two buttons. Which one do you want to click on the search? Quick. The green search one, which is smaller than the clear button, and it is the second of the clear button. So. I really wanted to show the additional search criteria, and I don't know why it's not working. But if you can imagine, the, the additional search criteria contains things like, I can only take a class Monday and Wednesday. I want to take a class with Zellers. Interesting thing is there's no option to say, I want to take a class anyone but Zellers. <laughs> All right? But there is a, I want this professor. There's a whole list of criteria. I can only take daytime classes. So I can only take classes from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. There's a whole list of things. You go in and figure all that out, and you go and boom, hit clear, and it clears everything out. Again, I, who knows why it's behaving this way, but it, it will normally clear things out. So, the one kind of thing they got right is they made it green. And green, the people have the mental association of go. Unless, of course, you're colorblind. All right. Or unless you don't really say, well, that's not really the green of a green light. All right. And 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 blue. Uh, the point is, is the, I guarantee this clear button has done more damage than good to people. All right. Because people people have told me people brought this to my attention that they were going in and searching classes and they put in tons of criteria. All right. And they accidentally clicked the clear button. Okay, there we go. Additional criteria. There's a lot of stuff. All right, starting time greater than 11. Yeah, and I can only take it Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I want, <laughs> begins with contains or is exactly, huh? can't exclude me. <laughs> but you can go in and you can pick all these things, and then, boom, hit clear, and they all disappear. Eventually, yeah. So, don't put the clear button on your page. It's just that simple, all right? Yeah, they can just refresh the page. If, if you're absolutely convinced that it's one in a million, still probably don't put it on there, because it probably isn't. You probably just haven't thought it through. So in rare cases, you can do it, but I would suggest always avoiding it. All right, just because. There's a good book in the library about web design that says, don't make me think. Now, software developers and, and web developers sometimes will 
disparagingly speak of users and say, what, can't people read? Well, no, that's not the attitude to have, all right? It's not their job. They're in a hurry. They want to schedule their classes. Anything that you do that forces them to make a little extra effort gives them a chance to mess up, all right? And in which case, keep it simple. It has nothing to do with the intelligence of the user, all right? Um, you know, no one wants to have to go through unnecessary steps or sit there puzzled or whatever because it takes more time and you always have the possibility of being in a hurry and clicking the wrong thing. So that's my spiel on that. Next time, we will view the actual, uh, next, yeah, we will actually view the HTML code for these things. I really want to make sure we conceptually understood what they brought to the table. So we'll do that. We'll talk about styling and HTML5 uh, tags. That might go into next week now that I think about it, but that's okay. All right. See you.